Uh, right, so um, the long-term scientific uh, benefits of a space infrastructure. So we've heard a lot about infrastructure today, and infrastructure, my take on infrastructure is infrastructure is the rockets and the astronauts and their training and the habitats and all of this, and all of this will require resources, and it's obvious from everything that's been said today that we'll get a lot more infrastructure in space if we use the uh, leverage the resources that are in space rather than having to lift them off the earth all the time. So here is one of these now rather hackneyed um, NASA uh, pieces of artwork. But it's interesting, this has some, a lot of infrastructure in this picture. Um, notice the transportation infrastructure, both the interplanetary infrastructure, this is the rocket, the interplanetary transport infrastructure, the local mobility infrastructure, the astronauts and their training are of course an infrastructure in a, in a sense, and so are, and the habitats. But there's nothing in this picture that indicates what this infrastructure is doing. This could be a scientific infrastructure. These could be geologists out doing field work. Um, or they, this could be an industrial infrastructure, mining the regolith for uh, titanium or whatnot, or but the poles, water ice. Or these could be space tourists who've been paying, paying their way. Or they could be all three of these things. These are not mutually exclusive things. And, and the point is, once you have an infrastructure on the moon, um, then it will facilitate all, all of these applications um, uh, together. So, uh, in terms of science, though, the reason we organised this conference today was to try and make the case to the scientific community that we, the science community, have a powerful interest in seeing a lot of this stuff happen. The infrastructure may be developed for um, companies that wish to make a turn a profit in space, or it may be implemented for tourist for touristic reasons. It may not. Science may be a quite a long way down the pecking order for the reasons for developing this infrastructure. But nevertheless, science will be a tremendous beneficiary. And of course, it's science that feeds back with the knowledge that tells the commercial entities where to, where to establish their, um, their, their, their resource extraction end of, end of the business. So there is this synergy between science and commercial activities. But I think the scientific community needs to understand that we have a lot to, by, by piggybacking on this activity, there's a tremendous amount of science that will get done that just won't get done at, at all otherwise, for all the reasons Martin articulated in his, in his first, first talk this morning. So anyway, I think there are, there are at least four non-mutually exclusive scientific benefits of using space resources to, fight, to build a space infrastructure. Right, so it's very important to realise these are not mutually exclusive. You see a list and you think you've got to pick one. But the whole point is all of these, th all of these points apply. Uh, but let, let's just go through them. So the first are the, are the scientific discoveries that will be, get made in the course of searching for um, extraterrestrial resources and will be discovered during the course of their extraction. Now, there's a long history of this. Um, of, uh, and, and in the geological communities, synergies between the academic scientists trying to understand the Earth as a planet and the resource extraction industries. These synergies have been going on for a long time. Of course, there's a beautiful example hanging on the wall outside, and that's William Smith's uh, map of the geology of England and Wales in, in 1815. I mean, this was, in the science of geology, this was really the beginning of our understanding of the history of the Earth and stratigraphy and paleontology and how all this stuff fits together. But of course, Smith, Smith made his map because he was out surveying for canals to transport coal around the, 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 around the UK at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Without, without the Industrial Revolution and the need for canals, we might not have had William Smith out in the field digging trenches. And, and yet the geological consequences of this have been, been profound. More recently, here is the, the Joides resolution from the, um, the ocean drilling program. I mean, this, 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 te this technology that, that basically drills through, through a lot of water and then into the sediments and, and the ocean floor, this is a scientific um, exploratory activity. I mean, there was a pa two papers in this week's Nature, actually, on iron 60 found recovered. Iron 60 is a radionuclide recovered from deep sea cores collected from the ocean drilling project. There's evidence for a nearby, nearby supernova in the, in the local interstate a medium uh, within the last few million years. You can just look up uh, this week's nature. But the point is, the, the, this is clearly building on the capabilities developed by the oil extraction industry. And yet, because, because the oil industry has needed to drill big holes um, to do to, for its business case, a, a capability, namely scientific 
deep drilling on the earth in this case um, has been developed which, um, from which science benefits. And of course the, 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 the scientific value of deep drilling on the moon or Mars or Europa, I mean this will be obvious to, 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 to all scientists in the room I think. Now in, in, the, in a lunar case, um, many will recognise this picture, this is the orange soil at the um, Shorty crater at Apollo 17. Landing sites of pyroclastic beads produced by some volcanic eruption on the moon long ago and covered with grey regolith. But you can imagine from, from a resource extraction point of view, the regolith will be the feedstock, right? So in the poles, the regolith will have ice in it, probably. Away from the poles, it, it'll have um, other, other materials that you might want to extract commercially. But of course, the lunar regolith is also a tremendous scientific resource. The lunar regolith contains this record. The lunar regolith has been exposed to the space environment for billions of years. It contains a record of the inner solar system over time, it, it, a record of the, the, the solar wind, the galactic cosmic rays, meteorites, micrometeorites. There's probably a lot of other very exotic stuff hiding in the lunar regolith that we haven't even thought to look for yet. But it's clear that any commercial activity that needs to process a lot of regolith for resource applications will have, will have the capability of finding interesting things in the regolith which will add to our scientific knowledge of the moon and, um, and the wider universe. There are many other examples I could give, but I, but I just don't have time. Um, the, second, the second bullet point is the, has been well articulated in previous talks. There's the, the economic benefits of using space resources in space to do space exploration and space science just because you don't have to lift all the stuff off the Earth. And Martin and others made this point powerfully earlier. And, and this is the, the diagram that shows how deep the Earth's gravity well is compared to the gravity well on, on, the, on the moon. So basically to 20 times more energy to get stuff off the surface of the moon to Earth's geostationary orbit than to get stuff off the surface of the Earth to Earth's geostationary orbit. And Paul made this point um, uh, very well. So in the context of building large space structures, space telescopes, or provisioning uh, bases on the Moon and Mars from which we would get a lot of science, clearly it will be economically beneficial to source those resources locally. And this will enable science to get done that otherwise we won't be able to afford to do. Um, now, uh, the, 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 four, the third bullet point here is a, a space economy, once it really gets going, the kind of thing that Jim, Jim envisages, will develop a lot of wealth. It won't primarily be developing wealth for science, but it will be developing an economy uh, which will, at some level, have provide sources of, of, of financial resources some of which can be, will be fed back into further exploration because the industries themselves will need that. But some of it, of course, will be taxed and will be feed back into, into a potential way of funding publicly funded schemes for um, space exploration as well as other things. So the, the, the bigger an economy becomes, in this case a space economy, everyone will benefit and so will science. Um, but the main point I want to make in this talk is the fourth one, the utilisation of, the so -called, of what I've called a dual-use transportation and, and infrastructure. And dual-use is, or triple-use, if you like, the, 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 as I tried to articulate on the first slide. You build these uh, habitats, you build these rovers, you build these rockets. They can be used for, com they may well be developed for commercial purposes by commercial entities, but, but science would be a, tr uh, um, a, a huge beneficiary of piggybacking on all that activity. So we can, Im we can imagine what they would be, and these have all been talked about before, but Martin made the point about <coughs> next generation large space telescopes. There are a lot of exoplanets out there, and many of them will be very interesting. To, fully ca to properly characterise many of them will require large space telescopes. And yet, as Martin also said, James Webb Space Telescope has become so expensive now, it's not clear that if the exoplanet community need a telescope ten times as big, um, where the funding will come from. So the build, being of res using resources in, in the solar system to construct the next generation of large space telescopes, either free-flying telescopes like the, the Darwin concept, uh, or observatories on the moon, this is meant to be a radio observatory or otherwise, um, uh, will become more affordable in, if the resources come are derived from space and from the Earth. Um, okay, resources on the moon. This is a moon base which facilitate a lot of lunar science and a Mars base, as in uh, his uh, Matt Damon here. I mean, this kind of pressurised rover 
be a fantastic thing, facilitate so much Mars exploration. But of course, it's just really not on building all, launch, building the building it from the Earth, launching it from the Earth all the way to Mars, and it really will not become feasible unless unless it's possible to use in situ resources. So we haven't talked a lot about tourism. Scientists tend to so we look down our nose about tourism, space tourism, very negatively until until you know the time summer comes, terms ended, and then we're off on our holidays. And, and even scientists are quite happy to get on an easy jet or something and go on holiday. Uh, but the point is there clearly is a market here, uh, and uh, we don't know whether well, we do know there is a market. How fast will how fast things will go from Virgin Galactic to a, it's a, an orbital hotel decked out in um, decked out in all its uh, advertising and to a moon. Who, who, who knows? But I do know that if such a such an infrastructure is developed, scientists will use it. And the reason I know that is we use it as scientists in our own work, don't we? I mean, some of my work takes me to do field work in Iceland. And uh, here is my colleague, Dr. Claire Cousins, who's now at the uh, University of St. Andrews, standing next to a hydrothermal pool on the Kirkville volcano in Iceland, where we did some field work some, um, uh, some years ago using, using, using this, this hydrothermal field as, an, as a Mars analogue site. Um, and here's our paper that we're quite proud of. Well, we've got several papers out of this work, but here's one. But the point is, we got to Iceland on one of these things. Our research, our research project on Iceland was very generously funded by the Leverhulme Trust. But if I'd had to write into my application that I needed money not just to buy an aeroplane, but to build an aeroplane from scratch, <laughs> and, 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 and not just that, the, the airport, the infrastructure at both ends, one in the UK and one at Iceland, in, in Iceland and the pilots and their training. <laughs> Right, it's impossible, right? I, we could not, the work that we report in this paper would not have happened had there not been a transportation infrastructure. And this transportation infrastructure is largely developed for touristic purposes, right? Some business travel, but mostly for, for tourists. So we, so, so we, we, we so, and, and astronomers, so, so this is geological field work, right? But astronomers who fly off to use the Anglo-Australian telescope, they too rely on this. So a lot of science is facilitated by an infrastructure largely developed for, for touristic commercial purposes, and science will certainly benefit. This could be Claire in a spacesuit, not writing a paper on a Mars analog site, but actually writing a paper on a hydrothermal deposit that she has discovered on Mars, right? And that kind of work just won't happen unless we can get to Mars, and, and so the, this is this kind of infrastructure would be very beneficial. Um, so I believe this is my last slide. So I just wanted to, which is my last slide, I just wanted to think really f further, further afield. So I, I, I literally and figuratively, so I mentioned, um, I mentioned exoplanets earlier, uh, and I think we now know enough, the statistics are such that every star to first order is going to have a planetary system. And some of these are going to be very interesting places. And the astronomers may find that some of them have potential biosignatures or other, other things. I mean, so the thing is how to get there. Now, we're along this. This is, a, this is, a, this is a, a, an artist, an Adrian Mann artist of, of, a, of a starship being built in Earth orbit. Now, who knows, who knows what powers this, right? It might be nuclear fusion. It might be antimatter. It might be beam power propulsion. Kelvin Long is in the audience. He can tell you all about, you know, but a lot of thought, and we know it's centuries away from being able to build such a thing. But I just know two things. One is the history of planetary exploration in our own solar system tells us we learn more about planets if we visit them in situ with spacecraft relative to what we can possibly learn using telescopes. And that logic must hold for exoplanetary systems as well, for exactly the same reason it holds for planets in our solar system. It's just the exoplanets are a very long way away. They will require very big stuff, very energetic stuff, uh, to get us there on time scales that are of at all interest to, to the scientific community. I mean, clearly, if you want to travel to a nearby star system in 50 years that forces your space vehicle to travel at 10% of the speed of light. It will be an enormous undertaking, right? So the other thing I know about it is it won't happen at all unless it becomes possible to leverage space resources. So Adrian has shown this, this, this that being, I don't know whether you can see it, it's quite dark, but here's the, um, um, a, a Skylon reusable space plane servicing this, this the kind of thing. That you need. Right, this is very, very forward-looking stuff, right? Um, the, real, the real uses of a space infrastructure, as I, 
outlined before, the large space telescopes, bases on the Moon and Mars and maybe further out in the solar system. But eventually, if we do become at all interested in exploring other solar systems, then it just isn't going to happen unless we've built up a, an infrastructure, an industrial infrastructure within our own solar system capable of utilising space resources. Thank you very much.